to her that is filthy and polluted, to the oppressing city. It is one of the most famous cities in the world, but San Francisco may be one of the dirtiest, too. An NBC Barry investigation reveals a dangerous concoction of drug needles, garbage, and even feces lining the streets of downtown. Investigative reporter Bagad Shaban explains why parts of the city are now being compared to some of the worst slums, not just in the country, but in the world. Terry and Jess, parts of the city aren't just disgusting. These diseased streets can be dangerous. Millions of your tax dollars are spent cleaning them. So why does one of the richest cities in the world have neighborhoods that resemble some of the poorest? Tonight, we investigate. tourism is taking a hit and you know why because they got a really bad homeless problem really bad I mean it was bad when I lived there a long time ago and it's a really bad now so bad that many businesses are demanding action from city officials Why the holiday vibe in San Francisco's Union Square is competing with a problem that's gone from bad to worse a business owner telling us the homeless situation is out of control a shocking video of what's going on in one of the busiest bar stations in the Bay Area several junkies blatantly shooting up out in the open others slumped along the corridors this is San Francisco's Civic Center station we sent KPI X5's Wilson Walker to ask the mayor and Bart what are you doing about all of this? Walls in broad daylight, the San Francisco neighborhood where crime is getting so bad, people are scared to step outside their own homes. We have been reporting on the decline of San Francisco, the nation's most liberal major city. As you may know, the city by the bay is a sanctuary place defying federal immigration law. It is also a town where permissive social policies rule. The result has been a sharp uptick in crime and a homeless situation that is now out of control. A city hit with an epidemic of car break-ins. They have jumped 26% in San Francisco this year, despite the police chief's focus on prevention. KPI X5 Sharon Chin is at Fisherman's Wharf, one of the hardest hit neighborhoods. San Francisco saw 91 car burglaries every day in a single month this fall. Justin Harris has been a victim. Recently, a friend was too. It was at night, like seven cars were broken into at the same time. In the year ending in October, car burglaries jumped from more than 25,000 to nearly 31,000, according to new numbers from the San Francisco Police Department. Three points tonight about woe unto the filthy city. Point number one is dung. Point number two is drugs, and point number three is dogs. Now, I, it would be sodomites, but I was trying to have the same letter, like a Pastor Jimenez style, you know, uh, dung, drugs, and dogs, all right? So point number one is dung. If you would, look down at your Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Look at verse 12. The Bible reads, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, that thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee, and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. Let me just guarantee you one thing. God has departed from San Francisco, California. God has forsaken that city. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor Anderson? Because the Bible talks about the fact that when God is with you and he walks amongst your camp and walks in your area, 
if he finds something unclean there, there's a good chance that he could turn away from that, right? Because it says here, thy camp shall be holy at the end of verse 14, that he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. And what unclean thing is he specifically talking about here? He's talking about human waste. He's talking about excrement, okay? He's talking about people using the bathroom all over the place. He's saying, look, God doesn't want to see that in the camp. And if he does see that, he might just leave. He doesn't want to step in that. He doesn't want to be around that. Now, I watched some stuff about San Francisco. I read a lot of news articles. And there was a news crew with just a mainstream news organization and they decided to go on a walk through San Francisco. They walked over 153 blocks. So they went actually 20 miles of walking, just walking up and down the streets of a portion of San Francisco. They found trash on every single block, 153 blocks, trash in the streets. They found 303 piles of human excrement on a 20 mile walk. Think about that. That means that for every mile that they walked on average, there were 15. Can you imagine walking one mile and having 15 piles of human dung on the sidewalk? That's San Francisco, California tonight. Is that disgusting? It's wicked. 303 piles of human waste and over 100 used hypodermic needles on the ground in that walk. So again, if you break this down, I mean, every mile, they're finding at least, what, five hypodermic needles and 15 piles of dung, trash on every single block. In fact, now they're publishing maps of San Francisco that show you how to avoid that's, the dung. That's the that's map. <laughs> that's where all the people are. That's, that's a dark puddle of where so many people on the street in that see, area. See, that's that. <laughs> and I don't even know how they clean that up. I mean, what do they do? They scrape it, hose the street down. Are they creating jobs? Let's look at it on the positive oh side. Maybe those uh, homeless that, that, people are that creating reminds jobs. Me of that. There's so many people <laughs> in San Francisco on the street. Sam, like my friend Jake Shields got a photo of this guy taking right in front of him, just spraying out right into the street from the sidewalk oh, into the street. No, oh, I don't know what. And they just do it in front of everybody. In fact, there's even a, a, an app for your smartphone that tells you how to avoid the dung in the streets so that you can try to steer around the worst concentrations of feces. Get stuck with the, these uh, disposed needles, you can get HIV, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. Dr. Lee Riley is an infectious disease expert at UC Berkeley. The fecal matter could possibly uh, get into air, and if you happen to uh, inhale that, it can also go into your intestine. Which can be deadly, especially for children. Dr. Riley has researched some of the dirtiest slums in the world, but believes contamination levels in parts of San Francisco may now be even worse. Much higher than what we, what we see in uh, places like Brazil or uh, Kenya or uh, uh, India. A new map shows just how dirty the streets of San Francisco are becoming. The map shows all the locations where human waste have been reported on San Francisco streets over the last eight years. So take a look and you'll see it's pretty uh, disgusting to look at. Well, it kind of makes the point, right? We've had more than 118,000 instances of human waste reported to the city. That includes an all-time high of more than 28,000 cases just last year. The map was put together by the data company The Open Book. The neighborhoods with the most cases include the Tenderloin, South of Market, Mission District, Portrero Hill, and the Financial District. I've never like winced looking at a graphic. Like yeah. where you're like, yeah, that map. Not, not a piece. Who are all these people that are just using the restroom all over the street? Well, most of them are drug addicted or drunk or both. Well, the Democratic stronghold of San Francisco has become, well, especially in downtown, a festering pile of garbage, feces, and drug oh, needles. needles. So this is a sanctuary city, is it? Well, here's a local deli owner. He's fed up. It's, it's filthy. It's disgusting. Yesterday, we uh, taped somebody just on the side of my building peeing on my restaurant. Uh, in broad daylight. I actually have pictures of people shooting up in the street. It's absolute mayhem at this point. It's completely out of control. Hey! I can't 
between you, okay? F you. She, she, yeah. she humbled every day. The window. She's listening. Yes, every day. And you have to clean it up. Yes. In the shadow of the West LA skyline, tucked under the 405 at Venice Boulevard, is a stretch of sidewalk some 40 people call home. At least once a week, the LAPD orders them out, blocks off the area, and an army of sanitation workers moves in, picking up used needles, bottles of urine, and mountains of garbage. They sanitize the sidewalk and then leave. But within minutes, people are back, rebuilding their life under the 405. The sidewalk is again littered with the hazardous byproducts of life on the streets. And worse because of this too. The homeless routinely leave their encampment to urinate on the streets of the neighborhood. And they defecate on the residential streets where children play. When sanitation workers do their cleanups, they stay inside the yellow tape, ignoring piles of human waste just a few feet away. Now look, you say, oh, how dare you get on the homeless people? They're just a little down on their luck. Oh, really? This guy's just a good place to hang out. Like many, these two come here from out of town. Do you like the lifestyle? Of course I do. Of course I do. Of course I do. As you just heard, they love the freedom of not having to follow the rules. Living out here by choice. Oh, 100%. You're living out here by choice. Oh, 100%. We met Dylan Brumley rummaging through the trash here in search of something to eat. And we saw him picking up a dirty needle. Were you going to use that needle? Yes. So why the Bay Area? Why are there so many homeless people here? Is it the weather? Is it our culture? There are some who say that has something to do with it. Former San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown talked to us recently on the culture. Here's what he told us. They are in other locations and, and there's no doubt people tell them exactly uh, how much better off you are if you are in need in San Francisco versus some other place. And so they will migrate to San Francisco for that purpose. And we are a very generous city, very generous city, very generous city, very generous city, very generous city. San Francisco is generous. It offers street people food stamps, free shelter, train tickets, and $70 a month in cash. I'm here to tell you something. Giving money indiscriminately to people who refuse to work is not making their lives any better. All you're doing is destroying our city and turning it into a cesspool. All you're doing. Here's a San Francisco art uh, Chronicle article. If you would turn to Mark chapter nine, the San Francisco Chronicle, main newspaper there, they say that San Francisco has doubled the money that they spend on homelessness to more than $300 million a year they spend on homelessness, $300 million. Honestly, after being out here for a long time, I really believe that like 80% of the people are out here because they want to be. Because, they because wanna either be. it's their choice to live the way they're living or because of drug abuse, that's what they're choosing. I think a zero tolerance is the direction we need to go. And San Francisco spends hundreds of millions of dollars every year trying to help, but critics say what's really needed isn't more money, but a whole different approach, but a whole different approach. Okay. The Bible says in verse number seven, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness, they work and eat their own bread. So this church had a problem with people, men, who wouldn't work. 
man who would not work at all. And Paul's saying, if any will not work, neither should he eat. The Bible says, okay, in, the, in the, Abel's religion, not Cain's religion, in Abel's religion, the Bible says that if any man will not work, neither should he eat. But they don't want to work. They want to do drugs. They want to get drunk. They want to lay in the street. They have chosen that lifestyle 99% of the time. They choose to live that life. I'm sick of this politically correct garbage that won't call out the homelessness for what it is, laziness. And if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. We have a major homelessness epidemic right now in the United States of America. We've contacted the police a few times over the last few months just about the fact that we're, we're sick and tired of our, our streets, our parks, everything just being infested with able-bodied young people who are living a homeless, derelict lifestyle, harassing us and stinking up the joint. The police department said, here's who's to blame, because they don't want to take the blame. The government doesn't want to take the blame, right? So they said it's the churches and the libtard college students. That's who's to blame. Because they said the churches are just giving them all indiscriminately free food, showers, clothing. They just give them everything and they have no incentive to work at all. No incentive to work. And then every year when the college students show up, the bums hit them up for money and they just indiscriminately give them money, give them money, give them whatever they need. The churches are doing the same thing. Hey, what's up guys? Sergio Jones here. We're out here passing out sandwiches, 111 degrees out, passing out water, giving back to the homeless, giving back to the homeless, giving back to the homeless. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Giving back to the homeless. He said, please, this is what the policeman said to us, please never give them any money. Never give them any food. Don't give them anything. Because they must have an incentive to go to work. 55% say they've been homeless for a decade or more. These people aren't exactly trying to change, are they? 55% say I've been homeless for more than a decade. policies that the government is enforcing and, and promoting is the problem with homelessness. The more you give homeless people to try and help them, the byproduct of that is more homeless people and more people trying to take advantage of this and probably more businesses that are nonprofit trying to help popping up and their whole intention is to keep more people in this cycle because they're getting money for it. At some point, this people have to realize you just can't be only nice and only try and help, which you should, but there has to be consequences. It has to be. The Tenderloin has long been viewed as San Francisco's armpit. Drug dealing and drunks, prostitution, the homeless and mentally ill. More than 30 years later, the downtrodden still line up for free meals at St. Anthony's Dining Hall in the heart of the Tenderloin. They serve 2,500 meals a day. Gary Camilla blames the nonprofits who are providing services to residents like the man who goes by Dirty Red. What the nonprofits want to do is maintain their stake here. This is where they have their, their, their structures. They own or lease dozens of buildings and, and thousands of people are housed and supported here. They're being part of the solution, but ironically, they're also part of the problem. The city uh, is very loath to step in and say, let's sweep this all away, let's move it somewhere else. In his recent book, Cool Gray City of Love, he blames progressive forces and nonprofits for impeding progress and creating a museum of depravity in the tender. And you know what? When I drive by these people and when they come here to the church, able-bodied young men, and ask me for food and money, you know what I tell them? Get a job, you lazy jerk. You lazy jerk, get a job. You're disgusting me by refusing to work. In fact, one of these lazy jerk types is sitting in the auditorium right now. This little punk here, this 22-year-old punk who's been sitting outside our church all week and he's told by the staff to leave. 
over and over again, no plans to get a job, no plans to do anything with his life, just lazy, sitting on his rear end. And we told him, hey, we don't want you loitering and sitting around here. He's like, oh, I'm reading my Bible and people give me money. Well, you know what? People need to stop giving their money to lazy punks sitting around for any reason. And you know what? If people would stop giving money to these panhandlers on the intersection that are 25 years old, able-bodied, when everybody's hiring right now, then maybe they'd stop standing out there. Maybe they'd do something with their life. Maybe we could clean this city up. Amen. Instead of everywhere we go in Tempe, it's an epidemic of homeless, lazy derelicts. That's right. And they need to go to work. And somebody needs to tell them the truth. And somebody needs to preach them the gospel of Jesus Christ and then teach them to observe all things that Christ commanded. That's right. Hypocrites. Especially a hypocrite who's going to sit on his butt and read the Bible when the Bible said six days shalt thou labor. Amen. And look, I'm all for helping people who legitimately need help, but people need to go to work. And if they won't work, then neither should they eat. That's what the Bible says. Amen. And I don't care if that's not popular. I don't care how many hateful emails I get. You can get up and walk out and say, well, I'm never coming back to this church. This church isn't compassionate. Well, don't let the door hit you on your way out because I'm here to preach the word of God and the word of God says, six days shalt thou labor. Amen. And the word of God says, you're wicked if you're slothful. And the word of God says to work with your own hands so that you'll have to give to people that actually need it, right. not to give to the lazy and give to the wicked. And you know what? Look, if, if everybody thought like us, we'd have this town cleaned up in one week. In a single week. If everybody rolled down the window and said, get a job, you lazy jerk, every time they drove by these people. If every single time we, we, these people asked us for money, we said, no, you're a disgrace. Get a job. You're young. You're able-bodied. You're able to work. Go get a job. You know what? It would clean it up so fast because just a few days of no handouts. And these people would be forced to do what? They'd be lined up at the day labor place. And you say, oh, the homelessness in America is out of control. What are the churches going to do about it? The churches are doing too much. What's the government going to do about it? The government's doing too much. Why? Because if you feed the bears at the national park, then they won't know how to get food on their own anymore. And you know what? It would do these people good to go a couple days without eating. You can go many days without eating and survive just fine. And you know what? I'll bet you they'll end up getting a job around day two or day three or day four of not eating. And you know what? They're going to be way happier because men who work are happy. I first got here, I was a man. But after being here for nine years, it took a toll on me. And now I don't feel like a man anymore. They have self-respect, they have dignity. But instead, we have 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 year old homeless. I don't really look people in the eye anymore. I look away because I'm just embarrassed. I feel hurt on the inside. I don't feel like a man on the inside because I can't provide for my family, you can't provide for my kids. You can open this book and read the written word of God and it's gonna tell you that if a man won't work, neither should he eat. That's right. It's gonna tell you six days shalt thou labor. That's what it's gonna tell you. It's not gonna say part-time shalt thou labor. <laughs> and then you wonder why you have a financial problem. If you have a financial problem, look to the Lord for the solution. And you know what he's gonna say 99% of the time if you live in America? Go to work. You're either married and have children or you desire to be married and have children and you are looking for work. You need to understand that while you are looking for work, looking for a job is your job. Looking for work is your work. Let me give you another hint for those of you that are needing a job. Take any job. Any job that is offered to you, to you take it. Oh, well, that's not the job I want. It doesn't matter. Take it. You say, why? Because notice what it says in Proverbs 14, 23. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to punery. People want to talk a lot about, I've got this goal, and I've got this goal, and I'm going to do this. But you know what God says? Instead of talking a lot, just work. 
When they offer you a job, just work. You say, well, that's not the job I want, but that's the job that I was offered. Here's what I would do if I were you. Not only is this what I would do if I were you, this is what I've done in my life. I would just take that job. And then you know what I would do when I'm not working that job? I'd be looking for a better job. And here's what I believe. If you just work, God will bless you. If you just do, just tell God, I'm willing to work, I'm willing to do any work, any type of work, digging ditches, whatever it is, I will do whatever you want me to do. Because here's what I know, in all labor there is profit. Then guess what you should be doing every day as you're looking for work? You should start looking for work at 9. And you should look until uh, about, you know, 10.30 and then take a 15 minute break and then go till about 12.30 and then take a 30 minute lunch break and then go till about 2 and take a 15 minute break and then go till about 5 and then be done for the day. And I promise you, if you wake up every day and spend 8 hours looking for work, you will find work. You'll find a job. Take any job and do good at it and be, be the best employee. Do well and I believe that God will bless you. Go to work! Everybody needs to go to work from Adam all the way until now. You're supposed to go to work, man, and get a job and do something with your life. Not be one of these hypocrites, one of these lazy people. And then look, people give them money and they think like, oh, I think I'm earning my way into heaven right now. Here's five dollars for the drug addict who won't go to work. And pray tell me this, I, I'm sorry that they're homeless, but can they at least use the bathroom outside the camp and bury that which cometh from them? You know, I know they don't want to obey the Bible when it said, look not on the wine when it's red. I know they don't want to obey the Bible when it said, be sober. I know they don't want to obey the Bible when it says, flee fornication. But can they at least obey the part of the Bible that says that when you use the restroom to bury it, to put it somewhere else? No, no, they're just living in their own filth. And now, bubbling at the surface, is the long-ignored cousin of addiction and homelessness, disease. We have not seen conditions for humans like this since medieval times, period, and that's a fact. Show you. Yeah. The buckets that we use are urinate, bowel movement. There's no way around here to use the bathroom. And that's hard on a person, you know what I mean? Especially you gotta walk around and find somewhere to take a crap. Yeah. Come on now. The authorities know hygiene is an issue here. The county health department reported that its teams observed feces and urine on eight of 10 sidewalks during a survey back in 2012. Street washes like this one have been instituted to help stop the spread of disease. If we don't power wash the streets, we end up with what we had years ago when we had a tuberculosis outbreak or a hepatitis outbreak. In San Diego County, the combination of drugs and homelessness turned deadly last year when an outbreak of hepatitis A eventually killed 20 people. A county spokesperson said that the majority of people who contracted the disease during the outbreak had been homeless and or illicit drug users. Tuberculosis is exploding, non-tuberculous acid fast bacilli exploding, and then the rat-borne illnesses, plague and typhus. And then we had typhoid fever last week. I, even I didn't think that, I didn't, I missed that. I mean, so typhoid fever means, oh, now we have oral fecal contamination, so that's gonna mean parasites and cholera. Here we go, everybody. Just everything you, everything you found in your history books, we got it, it's coming. He says that bubonic plague, black death as it was known, which killed 25 million people over a five year period in the Middle Ages, is likely already present in LA. It is caused by fleas biting rats and spreading it to humans. And an army of rats, millions strong, has overthrown Los Angeles. They have infested City Hall. The LAPD station in downtown LA was fined by the state for rodent infestation. Two employees have been infected by typhus. Cops have been diagnosed with typhoid fever, hepatitis A, and staff. This is the end of it right here. We're really close to the end of whatever our existence on this earth is going to be. Homelessness is exploding here, up 16% in one year, 36,000 wandering the streets of Los Angeles, 59,000 in L.A. County. Skid Row has been in L.A. for a long time, but not like this, never like this. Here is something that I found from Southern California. Down the co California coast in Orange County, a vast encampment of homeless people stretched for miles along a riverside bike path when officials eventually cleared the encampment in March, they reportedly found more than 13,000 used syringes in this little homeless encampment. 
and over 5,000 pounds of human waste. 5,000 pounds of, can you imagine living with 5,000 pounds of human waste around? Leviticus chapter 10 and verse eight, the Bible reads, and the Lord spake unto Aaron saying, do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when thou go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken of them by the hand of Moses. God's saying, look, you need to take heed unto my laws and my statutes. You need to teach the Bible to people so that they can put a difference between clean and unclean. Isn't it interesting that the same people who can't figure out the difference between male and female. Watch as Julian Castro explains that men who get pregnant have a moral right to taxpayer funded abortions. Just because a woman, or let's also not forget, Someone in the trans community, a trans female, a trans female, a trans female, a trans female, is poor doesn't mean they shouldn't have the right to exercise that right to choose. There are precisely zero people on planet Earth who fit that description. Not a single person, actually. There never have been any people like that. There never will be any people like that. Why? Because it's impossible. Biological men cannot get pregnant. Pretending otherwise is lunacy. They also can't tell the difference between clean and unclean, and they've turned their beautiful city into one large outdoor toilet. So salon owner Bebo Saab took yesterday. Unfortunately, it's not an uncommon scene in Union Square. Isn't it interesting that when a city is wicked and turns away from God, that they are covered in filth, literal filth, because they hate God's word, they hate God's laws. They don't want Leviticus 20:13. Well, it turns out they don't want Deuteronomy 23 either, so they'll just defecate wherever they find a place. The feces. Yeah, okay, it's common knowledge that San Francisco has a serious homelessness problem. The street-bound population is estimated at between six and 10,000, depending on who you ask. But the one thing that is very visible is the human excrement all over the sidewalks. In fact, during a coding challenge at Zillow, one girl created a poop heat map that showed the hot poop spots in the city. Whether you're stepping out at the Googleplex or Twitter headquarters in the Tenderloin, chances are you should probably look down because you're probably stepping in a huge pile of human excrement. Case in point, the subway. Now, normally you'd think I'd be complaining about subway service, but actually it's much, much worse. In July of 2012, an escalator at the Civic Center BART station grinded to a halt. When the work crews disassembled the device, they discovered an excess of human urine and fecal matter had gummed up the gears. It turns out so many homeless people were pooping on the escalator to watch the poop disappear when the grates would mash it down into the gears at the bottom. Now look, on the one hand, I understand the inclination to take a poop on the escalator and watch it disappear, but at the same time, I really don't want to live in a city with a public transit system that has to deal with mountains of human feces that are locking up the escalators, especially at rush hour. That is simply something I am not prepared to deal with. You know, God cares about cleanliness. God cares about sanitation. And San Francisco is a filthy place tonight. So point number one, dung. Point number two, drugs.
Well, let's read the Bible. Isaiah 28, verse 7. And they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They're swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. That's where drugs and alcohol are going to take you, my friend, to a filthy, vomit-filled, dung-filled place where there's nothing clean, and they're never going to show you that in the commercial. You're never going to see that in a magazine, but you'll find it on YouTube. It's reality. But listen to what this doctor said. They stated the obvious in this article. People might be using heroin for 20 years, and the really pleasant part of it might have been the first few months, and then another 19 and a half years of a kind of misery. And you know what? The verse that's perfect for that is where it says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. How long is a season typically, right? Three months, right? We have four seasons, three months each. This expert said they have about three months of enjoyment when they first get on the heroin. Three months are, quote, really nice, and then they have 19 and a half years of living hell. That's what 20 years on heroin looks like. The deputy said that there was a car accident here. You can obviously see that with the minivan here and the pickup truck. And they took one person out of the vehicle who they say have a, had a thousand yard stare, was out of it. And so now he's in the back of the ambulance here. He's my brother. Okay. My, I just lost, we just lost our dad to an overdose. You lost your dad to yes. an overdose? I've tried my whole life to keep my family sure. sober. Oh, Literally, I was no. so happy. <laughs> What's it like to go through this? Hell, hell, every day it is hell. She overdosed in her car while her two-year-old daughter was in the back seat. In San Francisco, they actually give out free syringes to drug addicts. And it's being reported that they handed out a total of 5.8 million free syringes in 2018. They also try to get the syringes back in order to prevent the spread of disease, but that hasn't been too successful. And just to give you a picture of San Francisco, California, it's a very small city geographically because it's on a peninsula, so it's all kind of crammed in. So it's about seven miles by seven miles. In fact, it's even a little bit less than seven miles by seven miles. And it has a population of 871,000 people. The government itself distributes each month 400,000 hypodermic needles to the people. So in a city that only has 871,000 people in it, the government's giving out for free over 400,000 hypodermic needles that are specifically to be used by drug users for shooting up heroin. The line starts here. We have the syringe collection. So they dump they, their used yeah, ones in here. Yeah, they dump the used ones on top. They get dumped into the container here. Uh huh. Then we hand out the new syringes. On a typical Saturday, how many people come in here? Today, we saw 149 people. Wow. And one, two, we did about 20, 21,000 today. So it was a little bit busy. 21,000 syringes. Yeah, in two hours, in two hours, in two hours. The city of San Francisco is now hiring for one of the dirtiest jobs ever, cleaning up used needles off the streets. Every month, us and our partners at the city collect 275,000 syringes. So that means that there are still 154,000 needles that are unaccounted for every 
month. I mean, how would you like to walk down the street and there's just used needles from people shooting up heroin, you know, in between all the other stuff? I spent countless hours picking up needles. In Boston, an angry father brought a bucket full of needles from a Roxbury playground to a community meeting. I found a, a fully loaded needle that had about five cc's full of heroin. Those who've been through it say getting pricked is a living nightmare. I had a number of shots. Bobby Rowland stuck by a syringe someone threw out a car window in South Boston several years ago. I was worried for a long time. And what were you worried about? What were you thinking? What happens if this guy had AIDS or something like that? In HIV, when they have tested it in the environmental surfaces, it can actually live in dry blood spots for five or six days. Brittany Jones, who says as a result of her run-in with a needle, quote, I am currently on harsh medication treatment for HIV prevention, which leaves me nearly bedridden for 28 days, unable to work, and having to wait three to six months to find out if I've contracted any disease from the needle. Because I'm here to tell you that drugs and alcohol create a filthy environment. Morrison took the I-team to an abandoned homeless camp in Lowell. These needles will float, they'll start floating. Countless syringes, more than 1,340 needles near the river, spilling all the river's problems into the Atlantic Ocean near Plum Island and Salisbury Beach. And they end up on our shoreline. A local family contacted 10 News after their trip to Ocean Beach turned scary. The Allen family's five-year-old was poked by a dirty hypodermic needle while she was playing in the sand. And as 10 News reporter Maria Arcega-Dunn learned, this is not the first time this has happened at that beach. Ultra beachgoers are being reminded to watch out for hypodermic needles in the sand. Earlier this month, a girl stepped on a needle at Hampton Beach. She was treated by lifeguards, then driven by her parents to the hospital. It was the fourth needle found on the beach this summer. The six-year-old boy picks up this bloody hypodermic needle and as you can see it is filled with some sort of li liquid. Tonight his father is worried about his child's health. You gotta start paying attention to the ground, okay? Okay. Kim Davenport is Anila's mom and often walks her to school. It's not safe, it's not healthy. Feces on the ground, needles. You've actually had to pull her out of the way to keep her Yes, of, of course. I just had to do that this morning. You're telling me drug needles on the street and human feces is costing the city roughly about $30 million a and year. Hamlet's, yes, just hot spots. It's a dirty job that New Roof says eats away at about half his street cleaning budget. In a city, in a home, in a business, they create mess and filth. Disturbing images of heroin use and homelessness in broad daylight. A fed up deli owner says this is what is outside his shop every day. And now he's challenging the mayor to do something about it. Open drug use has exploded in San Francisco in recent years, enraging residents who complain of having to step over people injecting heroin in train stations. On a recent BART ride of my own, I sat down, looked across the aisle to see a seat full of needles. So I snapped a picture and asked a simple question. How do we address this problem? This is the logic though today that says, oh, let's just give all the young people contraceptives in school so that they can do it safely. Or, oh, let's just, let's just teach people how to use alcohol responsibly. Let's just teach people how to, let's give them a safe space where they can shoot up drugs in a supervised facility. I want to give you a tour inside what would be the nation's first safe injection drug site if this is eventually opened. Right now this is just a prototype. You walk in, you'd be able to wash your hands before going to this supply center. And they have basically everything that a drug user would need. And, uh, several different sizes of syringes so people can take their pick. And then all sorts of supplies over here, including Let's give them clean needles so that they can do heroin. You know, we can't make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You know, we can't just sit there and have a culture that accommodates people's sins, accommodates people's filthy lifestyle, and makes it easy for them. No, you know, it should be hard for them to sin. It should be hard for them to shoot up here. Why well, want to help them do that? Because you know what message you're sending? You're just giving a green light, like go ahead and do it. You're not even helping them. You are, look, giving drugs to a drug addict makes them worse. 
giving alcohol to a drunk makes them worse. You know, how are they ever going to hit rock bottom? How are they ever going to be like the prodigal son where no man gave unto him? That's when he went back to the father's house and got right with God. You know, when you tell the young people, well, it's best if you practice abstinence, but hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod. If you do, here you go. Here's what you need. Here's how you can do it safely. Here's a contraceptive. No, it's abstinence. It's abstain from fornication. It's wait until you're married and keep yourself pure. We're not going to bend over backwards to try to make it easy for people to fornicate and do drugs and get drugs. No, they just need to stop doing it. We need preachers to get up and preach hard against these sins and rip some face. And we need a society that frowns on it and shames people that are on drugs and, and says, oh, you're addicted to heroin. You're, you're going to be ashamed of yourself. Get right with God. Oh, you fornicated? That's harlotry. That's whoredom. What a shame. Get right with God. Repent of that wickedness. But instead, it's like, well, you know, we got to you got to help these people out. Moving on, these stations are where people would be able to shoot up and basically be left alone. But you see these mirrors here. That is where trained medical personnel would be able to observe them while they're doing so to make sure that they're not having any sort of uh, medical emergency and overdose. And they have antidotes for heroin overdoses here on hand as well as oxygen tanks. I want to show you this. This is in case a drug user wants a little bit of privacy. For some, they're shooting up in their thigh, which means they're dropping their pants. There's also a spot here if they would prefer to lay down while they do their drugs. So people spend about a half an hour in this area, and then they have a chance to come over here, which is basically, excuse all of our media equipment, a chill-out room where you can enjoy your high apparently enjoy your high apparently enjoy your high apparently but this is also a place where people might be encouraged to find services the promoters of this space say that this is where they're able to sort of form a community and hopefully with the end goal of getting some of these folks into treatment again this is not legal in california right now it's not legal in the United States, San Francisco, looking for a special exemption that could allow this, and that bill is on the governor's desk. Well, what happens with that liberal, soft, bleeding heart philosophy? Well, you end up living in San Francisco, California, where you can't walk down the street without drugs and, and feces everywhere. It has been said that as goes California, so goes the country. And if this is where the rest of the nation is headed, then we are in serious trouble. 1.2 million, that's how many free syringes the Safe Point Syringe Access Program says it handed out last year just in Columbus. That averages out to more than 100,000 syringes every month. Not everyone is a fan of the needle exchange program. Roanoke's police chief says that the program will make it easier for addicts to break the law. It's there, meanwhile, all new at five, we have the first look inside a new syringe exchange unit in Northern Kentucky. For all the syringes that we distribute, we actually get back approximately 96% of all those syringes. The state gives syringes to around 20,000 people in the state, but could not tell us exactly how many syringes they give out every year. Florida lawmakers just approving a bill that lets communities create needle exchange programs. Right now, Miami is the only city here in Florida that has one. But as ABC Action News reporter Jake Peterson shows us, others are looking at the option bill that would legalize needle exchange programs in Arizona is now headed to the state Senate. Denver's needle exchange program is providing a safe place for drug users to get clean supplies. However, it's not without its controversy. Try this on. 30% of the homeless in San Francisco are openly sodomites. 30% are openly sodomites. So you walk down the streets of San Francisco and you have all these aggressive, uh, violent bums and homeless people accosting you. Just remember that about one third of them are openly sodomites. But that brings me to point number three, which is the dog. And I don't mean the four-legged kind of dogs, but I mean sodomites. The Bible calls sodomites dogs. Yeah, I just want to say anti-homosexual. I hope your kids turn out to be gay and you can deal with that. I actually pray that they're gay.
Call yourself a Christian church, meanwhile hating gays. You're judging all the people. You're going to hell anyways. You're trash, and uh, I really hope that you die. So keep judging, you stupid, retarded cunt. Hope you die a slow and painful death. Have a great day. Bless. <laughs> Bless our new founding fathers. <laughs> This is the Pastor Stephen Hansen and the members of his church. Why do you hate gays? Come on. Answer that. It's not a tough question here. Are you dumb? Are you stupid? Well, your guys are f***ing. That's why you want to follow them around. I guess that makes you a prick, too. You're a piece of and everyone knows it. Except for the idiot members you have in your church. Two idiot members of the church this time. You're all but nothing but sheep. <laughs> That's what you are. And the pastor answers kids, do whatever the f you want. Just remember, your kids are over in the long run. And by the way, have a nice day in hell. Verse 6 of 2 Peter 2, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just lot, vexed with the what? The filthy conversation of the wicked. There's nothing new under the sun. The same way that Sodom and Gomorrah was is the same way the Roman city of Pompeii was. And it's the way that San Francisco is becoming. I don't think San Francisco is anywhere close to as bad as Sodom and Pompeii and places like that, God. But that's the route that they're on. Pompeii was wiped out in a similar way to Sodom and Gomorrah because, and, and by the way, that's AD, where God allowed that volcano to erupt. And what came out of that volcano? Fire and brimstone. And what happened to it? It rained on the city of Pompeii and the city of Pompeii was completely wiped out. And God had to turn it into ashes because he had to burn up all the pathogens. He had to burn up all the germs. He had to burn up all the disease. He had to use fire just so that the whole place wouldn't be contaminated. That is an example to those that after should live ungodly. Don't tell me that's how God was back then. Because I don't know about you, but when I'm in Second Peter, I'm pretty close to the end of my Bible. How dispensational do you want to get? I mean, we're at the end of the book and he says, hey, remember Sodom and Gomorrah from back in Genesis? It's the same thing in 2 Peter. That is the example. You say, well, you know, well, how would Jesus treat these homos? Okay, well, what's the example that he gave? Show me an example in the Bible of how Jesus treated homos. Well, I look at Matthew, I can't find it. I didn't find it in Mark. I didn't find it in Luke. I didn't find it in John. You know why? Because God said, I already gave you an example. It's in Genesis chapter 19. That's the example to those that after should live ungodly. And again, we're told today that, oh, let's just fill our church with fornicators and sodomites and, you know, people who refuse to work and everything. Yeah, that's great because it's all about reaching people. You know, what Bible are you reading? By the way, 25% of the homeless are already registered sex offenders. There's over a thousand registered sex offenders on the streets of, of Skid Row. I'm haunted Andy by Bale is the CEO the of the Union Rescue Mission in the epicenter of Skid Row. His life's work is saving lives here. People get beaten, uh, women get raped. Um, it's just a brutal environment. Sex offender just roaming the streets in Phoenix with no address for police to check in on him. So how exactly can this be? Only ABC 15's Lexi Suter is getting answers for you. And Lexi, I can only imagine people in that area are not very happy about this. Yeah, they're very concerned and I want to show you why here. This man convicted of rape and kidnapping. Now, all we know about him, though, is he's a transient in the area of 11th Street and Indian School Road. And you know what? The Bible says that the righteous man considers the cause of the poor. It doesn't say the righteous man just gives all his money to every registered sex offender standing by the side of the road with a sign that says anything helps God bless. You know, the most wrathful book in the Bible is the book of Revelation. I mean, where are you going to find the most hellfire and damnation in the whole Bible? It's not in the Old Testament. It's in the book of Revelation. The last book in the Bible, you know, it's in the future. So don't tell me it's outdated. It hasn't even happened yet. Folks, that's an example to those that would afterward 
follow that filthy lifestyle. You know, anyone who lives in San Francisco should be scared to death that God's not about to just wipe it out, especially since it's sitting on this fault line of an earthquake. God someday is going to wipe that place out. 1906, a 7.9 magnitude earthquake hit San Francisco, and 80% of the city's buildings fell or burnt to the ground leaving 300,000 people homeless and killing nearly 3,000. You know, what makes San Francisco such a filthy place? Why, why do you say, woe unto the filthy city? Well, number one, it's covered in dung. I mean, that's what makes it a filthy city. There's human waste everywhere. 303 piles in 20 miles. San right, Francisco right is for built you. by street people. Why don't now people are taking a crap in the street. You walk a few hundred feet yeah. and you step in yeah. human yeah. excrement. Number two, it's the drugs. What makes it a filthy city? I mean, when you're walking down the street and people are just laying in the street, shooting up heroin openly, when you have to dodge hypodermic needles, you know, I'm pretty big on running barefoot. I don't think I would even have the guts to run barefoot through San Francisco. Now, I've run barefoot through Los Angeles. I've run barefoot through broken glass, but I'm not gonna run barefoot through San Francisco, California. Can you imagine the, 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 the bacteria? But can you imagine looking down, you feel that sharp twinge and you have some hypodermic needle from some sodomite homeless drug user hanging out of your foot? Oh man, forget that. You know, I'll buy all the Nikes and forget everything I ever told you about barefoot running if you live in San Francisco, all right? Let's take a closer look at some statistics and incidence rates of STDs in San Francisco. Studies suggest that STD incidence rates are on the rise throughout California. But according to a survey from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from 2013, STD rates are two to three times higher in San Francisco than in any of the other cities of the Bay Area. I can't figure out why. It must be that discrimination that's going on in San Francisco. Or maybe it's that lack of information. If you're smart, you keep away from prostitutes and pickups. Most of them have syphilis or gonorrhea. They're not safe. And they can't be made safe. A record number of cases of chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis diagnosed in California last year. More than 300,000 people tested positive for the sexually transmitted diseases. 30 babies were stillborn due to congenital syphilis. If untreated, STDs can have serious long-term effects including infertility and vision loss. And guess what? The, the, the city with the least homos was Birmingham. What was number two? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, all right. Number three was Memphis and number four was San Jose. Did you hear that? San Jose, California has one of the lowest amounts of homos. It's in the same area. I mean, you know, San Francisco's up on the peninsula. It's like an hour away in San Jose, California, which is also a big bustling city. It's packed with people. But isn't it interesting that they have half the homos, they have way less STDs. I wonder if there's a connection between homos and STDs. And HIV is not the death sentence it once was. You would live reasonably well with the condition, but medical expenses may prove expensive. Intravenous drug users and homosexuals and homosexuals and homosexuals and homosexuals are more likely to become infected with over 80% of cases involving gay sex or the sharing of dirty needles. I wonder if there could possibly be a connection between feces in the street and a dirty city. He looks out now, and he too is scared. He too is outraged. This is real. Yeah, it's it's real, and you know, who knows? This is like a Petri dish for disease. He knows. While delivering water to the people he serves, he contracted staph, E. coli, and strep. It cost him his leg. And the lost souls on the streets below have no idea what they're up against. I mean, is it a life or death situation? No. I mean, it's just a part of life being sick. It's been easy enough for most people to ignore the plight of Skid Row. On Alvarado Street, a man walks out into traffic to avoid the filth. At Venice Beach, called the new Skid Row by some, tents and the things that come with them are on full display. I mean, folks, wake up. Pastor Anderson's not the one that's crazy. It's not Jason Robinson that's crazy. 
It's not Roger Jimenez that's crazy. You know what? It's these people that have forsaken God's laws. They don't want Leviticus. They don't want Deuteronomy. They didn't just throw out the morality. They threw out the sanitation. This rugged dead raccoon in the McDonald's. Look at this. Sonnier is a business owner in the city of San Francisco. He says he's thinking of abandoning San Francisco after he was bitten twice by vagrants. He joins us tonight. Gil, thanks very much for coming on. It's hard to believe this is even real. This is like a Dawn of the Dead scene. Yeah. You were bitten. How, tell us the circumstances. Well, the, the last event, um, it was a guy who came in and we asked him to leave and he left and he came back 15 minutes later to harass the employee and uh, he hit somebody and uh, it got really violent. Some of the staff subdued him and we tried to call the police to have them intervene and arrest him. And in the process, he decided to bite me. And one of the statements he made was, why even calling the police? They're not gonna do anything. They're just gonna let me go. I remember one time I was in San Francisco, this is like 20 years ago, it wasn't even as bad as it is now. And I walked down San Francisco's street as a teenager and a bomb just hurled an empty glass bottle and it just exploded like 10 feet from me. You know, it kind of was startling having somebody throw a bottle that near you and just explode. And I looked at the guy and the guy just gave me a look like, what are you gonna do about it? This is the way the bums are. You know, they'll throw something at you and then just, what are you gonna do about it? The most disheartening manifestation of homelessness is the daily exhibition of mentally ill people screaming at the sky, tearing at themselves, and otherwise behaving beyond their own control. Now, listen to me, thou Bible-believing Christian. Screaming at the sky, tearing at themselves, and behaving beyond their control. Hmm, I wonder, what do you think's wrong with these people? What do you think's going, I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. They're demon possessed. This isn't a bad car accident or a gunshot wound. So this guy just arrived. He's completely naked, wrapped in a sheet. There's a huge medical team taking care of this patient right now. He was just running through the streets. His heart rate is just dangerously elevated right now. 911, what is your emergency? I'm going to detox mode right now. He got my money, and I want my drugs. He's getting on an When people get high, it can get scary. Some run through the streets naked. Others climb fences and get seriously injured. One man seen here trying to break into a police station. People think that they're being chased, they're being shot at, uh, the devil is chasing them. I have a sitter. Why are they screaming at the sky? Who are they screaming at? The Lord. They hate God. They're screaming at God himself, shouting to the sky, screaming at the sky. Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 17. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he what? Teareth him. So this guy's tearing himself and he foameth. He's foaming at the mouth, gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. Isn't it interesting that the newspaper article uses the exact same wording that the Bible keeps using about these demonic people that they're tearing themselves as they yell at the sky and behave beyond their own control.
It says he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And this is exactly what you're going to see if you look on YouTube, all the videos of these violent, aggressive, wild, insane homeless people roaming the streets of San Francisco, California. In fact, one person described San Francisco, California as the world's largest outdoor unsupervised mental institution. If you're going to San Francisco, be sure to download the app that tells you where all the poop is. You know, cause in the streets of San Francisco, it's the world's largest outdoor unsupervised mental institution. I'm pretty much done talking about San Francisco, but I, I think I've made my point. I think you get the picture of why I say that San Francisco is the perfect example of a city that turns away from God, rejects the Lord, rejects the commandments of God, doesn't want hard preaching. I mean, show me one red hot soul winning church in San Francisco, California. I don't know, I don't think it's out there. So what's the answer? What's the answer tonight? Here's the answer. It's very simple. Be clean, abstain from drugs and alcohol. Let me add one that's not in my notes. Go to work, get a job, stay busy working. Remain pure and put the sodomites out of the land, which obviously we don't have the power to put them all the way out of West Virginia or all the way out of Arizona, but you know, at least put them out of the church, put them out of your social life, and just when you see them, just stay away from them to the best of your ability. Why? You don't want the germs. You think it's a coincidence that the most homo city is the dirtiest city in America, where people are now saying it's worse than a third world country. They're saying it's worse than, than, than horrible countries where there's just uh, poverty and slums and filth. You know, play, places in, in South America and Africa, they're known for being dirty. People are saying, no, San Francisco's worse. It's more unsafe. You think it's a coincidence that that's where the sodomites are? You don't want the filth. You don't want the spiritual or physical garbage that they're carrying in their bodies. Stay away from it. Inspire Eds and have a word of prayer. I mean, just when I thought I'd seen it all, the coup de gras, a lotto ticket, a lotto ticket. So that's the pathway out of poverty for this derelict who refuses to work so lazy, he can't even pick up a, a, a piece of trash. So then I had to go out there this morning and go clean up all his trash, right? But his pathway out of poverty is a lotto ticket. One of these days. He's gonna win big, and then he'll never have to work again. You lazy fool! Right. Only lazy people never wanna work again. I wanna work for the rest of my life! I was born to work. God created me to work. I wanna work six days a week for the rest of my life, till I die. This crazy boy, I tell you, only in San Francisco, only in San Francisco. You know, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, that is it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned and we've done stuff worse than lying. Let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights. 
Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean, the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean, it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting. It means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus, okay? But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what about all our, we did all these wonderful works, why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me, I never you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me. I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. 
Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.